Some time ago, there was a man staying in the Swiss Alps, and he was awoken by this crashing sound, like the mountain was going to collapse. And what happened, he went downstairs and spoke to the man at the front desk and said, listen, I'm really scared. The, my room is shaking a little bit. I hear this crashing sound. Is, is there an earthquake or something? And the gentleman said behind the desk, no, there, it's not an earthquake. Actually, when the sun rises in the east, it begins to melt the snow and the ice, and it begins to expand. And then you hear this crashing sound. But that crashing sound is not the end of the world. It's just the beginning of a new day. Today I want to share a message about praise. And if you've seen your bulletin, it says, I believe there's power in praise. But actually, I, the real title, I like the title, is Shaken by Praise. And before we read our text, I just wanted to define praise, and it's to honor, to lure, to adore, extol, exalt, magnify, and admire. And there's a quote I want to share with you. For the Christian, praise to God is an expression of worship, lifting up and glorifying the Lord. It's an expression of humbling ourselves and sending our attention upon the Lord with heartfelt expressions of love, adoration, and thanksgiving. High praises bring our spirit into to a pinnacle of fellowship and intimacy between ourselves and God. But true praise is not merely going through these motions. Jesus spoke about the hypocrisy of Pharisees who worship, whose worship was only an outward show and not from the heart. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Genuine praise to God is a matter of humility and sincere devotion to the Lord from within. Uh, before we read our text today, and we want to expand that just a little bit, uh, the text will be Acts chapter 16, 22 through 26. What was going on before this, before we read our text, that Paul and, and Barnabas were out on their second missionary journey, and what happened was they had a sharp disagreement, it says in the scriptures, which is, sharp is a pretty uh, <laughs> descriptive word, isn't it? So Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark, and he had, John Mark in the past had abandoned Paul uh, previously, so Paul said, no, we're not taking him with us. We're gonna leave him back here. And so Barnabas and Paul disagreed and they parted. So uh, Barnabas took John Paul with him, I believe to Cyprus, I believe, and then Paul chose Silas. So they're on their way. They had planned to go to Asia at one point, but it says the Holy Spirit stopped them. And then they had other plans, and it said the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ stopped them. Isn't this something how sometimes we have our own plans, we want to do things that we think are right, and all of a sudden the, the Lord puts a roadblock up there, he says, no, you're not going this way. I've got better plans for you, because you're going to do something that I want you to do. So this brings us to our, our text. And before I say this, this, who was the author of the book of Acts? Who was the author of the book of Acts? The Holy Spirit. Right, the Holy Spirit, yes. But through what person? Very good. Luke, yes. So Luke was there with them. And along the way, Timothy, they came across Timothy. You're familiar with Timothy. Okay, so let's go to our text now. Acts 16, 22 through 26. The crowd rose up together against them, and the chief magistrates tore their robes off, off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw with them into the inner prison and fastened their feet into the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and their prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors opened, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm them, harm yourself, we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in, 
And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Well, what brought the, what was the event that brought Silas and Paul to be placed in prison? Well, they were out there preaching the word. And what happened was they came across a, a slave girl, it says in the scriptures, that had a spirit, that had, that had a spirit of divination. Now, apparently, I guess she was fortune-telling, doing whatever, her thing. And what she was going around, it says that she was following Paul and Silas. And this is what they, it says in the Word. She was saying this, crying out. These men are bondservants of the Most High God who pro are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. It says in the Scriptures that Paul was annoyed. Can you see Paul being annoyed? Saying, I can't believe, just stop, leave me alone. And he finally just said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And that spirit left immediately. It didn't even hesitate. Boom. And it was gone. So what happened was the masters of the slave girl were making money from her. Because people were coming and paying money to, for fortune telling whatever. And they were upset. So they reported that to the magistrates and said that they were saying things that were contrary to Rome. So what happened was they tore off Paul and Silas's robes it says in the scriptures and they whipped them and then they placed them into prison so that's what we hear we read the scriptures now and then we'll go into detail it, it's something when you look at that uh, why do we praise the lord what's the what's the purpose of praise well i read in the quote why and so and how to praise but uh, one of the things is that our father is worthy of praise our god and creator is worthy of our praise it says in the scriptures I like to read a few of the scriptures that state that. It says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. That's Psalm 18.3. In Psalms 96.4, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. So, little g. Psalm 145.3, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. And in Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The first thing we should do in the morning when we get up is praise God and be thankful and thanking Him that we have another day, another day to serve Him. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your kindness, your mercy, your grace, that I have breath this day to serve you. And if we go back to the book of Luke, I believe chapter 11, we'll see when the disciples asked Jesus, can you please teach us how to pray? And what was the first thing they said to, that Jesus said to the disciples? Is what's the say in, in, in the Lord's prayer? Father, hallowed be thy name, for, for you are holy. That's praise. And you're, we're talking of, the God, of God's character. And, and that's something that we need to remember. And all of his great works, that, that he, he's performed and does every day. And number two, we are called to praise him. If we go to the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 5 and 9, those two verses, it says, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's something throughout the Psalms that's filled with praises. And there are several authors in the Psalms. And, and just going to the Psalms and reading them and praying through the Psalms in those, in those praises is incredible. And if you go to Psalms 100, it says, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. And number three. Praise opens the door to the power and presence of God. Now, if we reflect back into the, 
the, uh, the verses here. How would you feel about being arrested and then beaten and then thrown in jail? And that, now these jails aren't the current day jails that we see that have a toilet and a sink and uh, a little bed and sheets and pillow. Uh, if, if you look back, and I'd like you to do that, to really take a look at what the prisons were like back then. And at, at some point it says in the scriptures that the uh, guard actually had to bring light in. So imagine it could be in complete darkness in, in, in prison and cold and wet and everything else. It, it's really easy to think about it. Uh, when when the, the prison doors are open in, in life, you think in life in general, it's easy to praise God, isn't it? Things are going our way. Everything looks shiny and, and, and rosy. But when the difficulties of life, the trials and tribulation come upon us, which they will, is it easy to praise then? Are you in praise mode and prayer mode? And that's what we have to remember. And when you look at Paul and, and Silas, they knew God's, God's power. They knew who God was. And it says in the scriptures that, that they were singing psalms and hymns. Now, that's what we have to remember. They were going to the word, repeating the psalms. And that's what we need to do through those difficult times. It's pray our way through and give him praise. Because if we're focused on the trials and tribulation, we're going to have a problem. If we're focused on being in jail after we've been beaten down with the trials of life, there's a problem. That can cause what? Depression, anxiety, and everything else. In Psalm 22, verse 3, it says, But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. And if we take a look, what, what was the immediate response when Paul and Silas were singing hymns and psalms? What was the immediate response? There was an earthquake. It shook. Those chains were broken. Now, the jail itself wasn't destroyed. That's the amazing thing here when you take a look at this. The jail itself was still intact, but the chains were broken the doors that were locked were opened up. They were set free, weren't they? And the same thing goes for us. We're in that praise mode. When we're focused on God and his goodness and his character and his deliverance and having faith and believing in him that he will deliver us. That's the place to be. And also praise releases our faith and chases away our enemy. The jailer there uh, the penalty would have been if they had left the prison, the jail, and escaped, the penalty for that for the jailer would have been death. So he's about to take his own life. He was about to take his own life with his own sword. Well, what did Paul do? Did Paul and Silas take off? No, this was an opportunity for sh to them for, to share the gospel of Christ, to share a deliverance. And what happened was the guard came in with a lamp. And I'll, I'll go into this in a second. But I like to read two Psalms. Psalm 8, 2, verse 2. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies. Because of your enemies. To silence the foe and the avenger. And then Psalm 149, 5 through 6. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Those chains can't fall off by themselves, can they? Those doors can't be opened by themselves. And then number five, our praise can be a witness to other people. It says in, in verse 27 that the, or verse 25, that the prisoners were listening to them singing the psalms and the hymns. So you have witnesses of this. And it's something that you see Paul, you see Silas, they could have been discouraged, they could have blamed God, they could have been bitter, but they knew God. They knew his word. And so they put their faith in him. And 
When people saw that, I'm sure, it's my, my belief, when they witnessed this, they were probably saying, what are these guys doing? Here they're locked, they've been beaten, thrown in jail, they're here with us, they're chained and they're singing psalms and hymns to God or this God. Because at that time, Philippi was a Roman colony. It was a Roman colony. And, and they weren't aware that, that Silas and Paul were, had, had Roman citizenship. Because the Roman prisons were different from the non-Roman citizens. They were a little bit more, they were better. Okay, a lot better. All right. But there were witnesses to them singing psalms and hymns through their difficult times. I remember years ago, uh, where I was worshiping, uh, there was an individual there that had, was dying of cancer. He had brain cancer, and it was going through his whole body. And this gentleman, I, I loved him so much. His attitude was such an encouragement to me, because he never talked about himself. He never talked about his illness. He never even asked for prayer, although we did pray for him. What he wanted to know, Matt, how are you doing today? While well, this arm was hanging down like this because of his brain cancer, he couldn't control all of his body. Isn't that amazing? Here's a Christian that was faithful, strong in his faith, believed God, and he knew where he was going in the end. And that's what we have to believe as, believe, as, as Christians. Through these trials and tribulations, praise God through them, thank Him, and know where we're going to be someday. That ultimate reward. And then praise takes our mind off our circumstances and keeps us focused on our Father. It's something I, all of us, as I said, have been through trials and tribulation. And when we go through those difficult times, I, I, there's been many times I've had many trials, I'm sure you all have. But I know when I start feeling sorry for myself and start doubting God, that's when I'm miserable. But I, then I remember, what, what am I sharing here? To praise and to pray. And all of a sudden, these shoulders that were down here like this are now up here like this, and I'm looking up as opposed to looking at the circumstances that I know that God's taking care of me. And if he's allowing me to go through whatever I'm going through, there's a purpose for it. And I pray that that purpose will draw me nearer to him. And if we have that attitude, we're going to breeze through those trials. Sure, there'll be difficulties. But it'd be so much better. So much better. <clears throat> and then in Psalms 134.1, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. So imagine every day we're going around praising God and thanking Him. And Paul says to be continually in prayer. And that doesn't mean while I'm talking to Tom or someone else, I'm praying necessarily. But when I'm working on my computer or whatever I'm doing at home, I can still be in prayer and praise constantly. Do you understand? You can be when you're out on a recreational activity, if you're doing something. While you're driving, praising God and thanking Him, it lifts your spirit. It lifts it up. Um, there's, there's a story of, of an individual that uh, it said that when I was reading this, it said he was a great man. And uh, it, it sounded more like he was a king, by the way they were talking. But he, has his, he had his entourage around him. Tom knows what it's like. <laughs> and what they're doing is praising Him. They're saying, oh, sir, we bow down to you because of all your great works. The sea listens to you. The, the weather, the, the earth, everything in the, in the world listens to you. It's at, right in the palm of your hand. And this, this king or, or, or great man, apparently, was wise. And he knew they were trying to flatter him and make him feel good. So he says, you know what? I want you to bring my, my throne, my chair here, and let's go down to the sea and, and let's put it on the shore. And as the high tide began to come in, he sat in his chair and he said, Oh, mighty sea, stop! Do not come upon me! And what happened? The sea came upon him and got him wet. 
And he said again, as low tide, another day, did it again. See, I command you to stop. And what happened? The water came in again. And he showed his entourage. He says, listen, I don't have all this great power you think I have. There's only one who has that power. He is the one who holds the sea in his hand, the ocean, the waves, that is in control of all things. And he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And that's what we have to remember. Because you might be going through, as we talked about, that first story that I told about the earthquakes, about that man was scared because the earth was shaking. He felt that it was, it was, that was the end of life. Where we're going through those difficult times, whether it be with your family, whether it be fin a financial reason, wh whatever the cause, your health, whatever it is, what we need to do is focus on our great Father and give Him all the praise and glory. Because He deserves it, doesn't He? We see that in the Scriptures. He is worthy to be praised. Amen? If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord, the one who gave His life for you, I ask you today to come forward and to receive him and enter the waters of baptism. The, according to the word, not according to Matt, not according to Tom, not according to Gordon or anyone else here, but according to the word of God, it says that, number one, that we have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came and gave his life for us and that he died, took our sins upon him, suffered and died, and that he was resurrected from the dead and that he's alive today. And number two, that we confess with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. And number three, that we repent of our sins. That means we do a 180, not a 360. I heard that the other day in a meeting. Someone said, yeah, this person did a 360. I said, well, that means they're back in their old ways. I said, it's a, it's a 180. <laughs> and after repentance, we turn away from our sin and say, Lord, I want to I, I start a new life with you. And then we what? Are baptized. Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized. And then we live a life faithful unto death. Does that mean we'll never fall or slip up? No. We, 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 we mess up sometimes. But we have the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have forgiveness through him. Doesn't mean, as Paul said in the book of Romans, we don't have a license to sin. Now I have this freedom now that I'm saved. I can go out and do all I want, anything I want, because God forgives me. No, that's not true. Because if we truly are saved, we're going to want to live a faithful life to him. It still doesn't mess, mean we're going to mess up, not going to mess up. Okay? So as we sing our song of invitation, if you need prayer or want to come to the Lord Jesus Christ for your, the forgiveness of sins, to take your shame, your pain, all of your sin upon him, that you'll have forgiveness and the gift of eternal life come forward today as we sing our song of invitation. Mm -hmm.